So thanks very much for this uh, introduction. It's really a pleasure for me to be here. This is my first time in Philadelphia, although I've been in the country for like 25 years now, so it's about time, I guess. So. <laughs> and I, I couldn't fail to remark that it's somewhat similar to Boston, actually, in that combination of older and newer uh, buildings. And I think uh, I, as a European originally, I like that kind of mix, actually. I think it makes me feel somewhat at home. You don't see that on the West Coast, actually. Uh, okay. Okay. So the other reason why I'm, I'm very honored to be invited as part of this Humanities Forum, thank you, um, because I think that it reflects, as a biologist, because I think that it reflects a trend in science to become more multidisciplinary, to combine various areas of science, not only in, let's say, the biological sciences, or the physical sciences, but also a combination between biological and social sciences. And certainly in my area, which is really the study of crop evolutions, that's what we need to do. And yet, over time, people have studied crop evolution either from the biological side or from the social sciences side. And what we really need to do is to combine both. After all, crops don't, don't have legs, like I tell my students. You know, somehow they have to get planted, they have to get harvested, and who does the job? It's humans, okay? Conversely, over time, over the several thousands of years, humans have come to rely on agriculture to feed themselves, close themselves, and we would not be able to survive without agriculture. So there's really this strong, close, mutual relationship between crops on one side and humans on the other. And so I think that it's very appropriate to have kind of this, these events that establish this close relationship between biological and social sciences. Okay. Now, to keep in mind the... Um, the overall theme of the forum this year, I've chosen to actually emphasize a number of stages in this mutual relationship between crops and, and humans. And uh, clearly, one could also have a talk on, on animals, domestic animals, and, but I'll, I'll focus primarily on, on plants in this talk. Uh, the first stage is that the origin of agriculture is about, can be traced back to uh, 10,000 years, and that it meant a switch from a nomadic to a sedentary lifestyle. The second one is that the origin of agriculture actually introduced a positive feedback into the tendons, the trends in population. It led to a population increase, which then in turn led to, led to migrations from the centers of origin of agriculture. And I'll uh, illustrate that. A third important phase was after the, what is we call the discovery of the Americas, where that led to a, a, an ex extremely important exchange in crops between the old world and the new world, to the point you'll see where we can barely sometimes recognize the origin, uh, at least, uh, of crops in, in, in general. And then I'll finish then with what is the current situation uh, in which we have a, I would say, a, a chasm between food production and food consumption. Uh, where people barely know or realize where and how their food was produced. Okay. So let's start then, and let's go to the supermarket. <laughs> because if you talk to people in an urban society, they say, well, where does the food come from? Food comes from the supermarket. Okay. And this is a fairly typical, this one I took in Boston, but I could take it in uh, photo taken in Philadelphia or in Davis. It's well lit, it's clean, and it's well stocked. Okay? It is, however, as I just remarked, um, somebody in the audience, um, it is actually fairly diverse. It's more diverse than what you would have seen 10 years ago. Because we have sweet potato, this is what you would have seen 10 years ago, but you also see cassava now, jicama, and taro. And that raises then two major questions in light of this uh, talk. Is first of all, where were these produced? And for one of them, you have actually the, uh, the answer. You have sweet potato produced in Louisiana. But what about cassava, taro, and jicama, for example? So that's one question. And then a, another question on the longer term is, where did these crops originate? Okay. And so 
I'll or organize my talk around these two questions. Okay? And I'll start with the, the actually the second one, where did domestication uh, take place? So these are the two, the two essential questions I will be asking. Where was the crop produced and where was the crop domesticated? Now, agriculture, and without people realizing it, has become a very important part of our planet. It takes up a major part of the land and of the resources. And to the point where some of the major landscapes famous landscapes on our planet are actually agricultural landscapes. And I'll give you here a few examples from Vietnam, from here in the United States, in the Northwest, and from Europe, for example. All typical agricultural landscapes that we value. Now that was not the situation until recently, because the hominid family, which is the, the biological family to which Homo sapiens belongs, uh, has only been in existence for about five million years. And it has been characterized by a rapid succession of species with increasing capabilities, intellectual and material capabilities. One of those species is actually, it's uh, Homo erectus. And that is the first hominid species that migrated out of Africa. And it invaded it, uh, or it occupied this territory primarily here in Africa and then in Southern Asia, including what is now called Indonesia. Our species originated about 1,000 to 150,000 years ago. It was also of African origin, and it migrated out of Africa, but in contrast with Erectus, it managed to, I would say, invade all the continents except Antarctica. Okay? Because it basically has a nomadic life, it had a nomadic lifestyle. Okay? And so you see here some of the ages and the migratory uh, pathways that Homo sapiens, and here we go into uh, the Americas, obviously. So that is the situation in which we had on this planet when agriculture started. We had one species, Homo sapiens, that was distributed over all the continents, but still had a nomadic lifestyle. Now agriculture, as I told you, started 10,000 years ago, um, we're going to look at, in the next slides, where did, did it originate? When and why did it originate at the time it originated? Why 10,000 years ago? Why is that so important? What is domestication? And what are the consequences of this switch to agriculture? So this is a slide that summarizes the work of a large number of people over a large number of years and it summarizes the origin of some of our major crops. And the shaded areas here represent the, what is called the centers of origin or the centers of domestication of, of, of crops. And what you see is that these centers tend to be fairly limited in size, concentrated around the equator on either side. And the other thing to, I've listed here some of the crops that were domesticated in these different regions. Now the important point here is to uh, remark that most probably these were independent centers of domestication. So people introduced agriculture independently in different areas of the world. So this is a case of multiple inventions. Okay. The second point is that in each of these independent areas, people tended to domesticate crops for similar basic needs. So you had a carbohydrate crop, a source of carbohydrates, mostly cereals, you have, for example, rice in China and Southeast uh, Asia, maize in what is in Mesoamerica, uh, potatoes in the Andes. You have a source of protein, very, so very often a member of the legume or pea family. So you have pea here in what is called the, the Near East or the Fertile Crescent, uh, but you have beans here in the Americas, you have soybean in China. You have a number of vegetables and fruits that were domesticated. You have also a type of fiber, whether it's cotton, flax, and so on. And also a uh, type of stimulating beverage. It could be uh, tea in, in China. It could be coffee in Africa. Or it could be uh, cacao here in Mesoamerica. Okay. So, but people looked at, in these attempts at agriculture are to satisfy their basic needs. 
Now, one of the, the changes in society that took place with agriculture was that people switched from a nomadic lifestyle to a sedentary lifestyle. And one of the best places to investigate this is actually in this, what is called the Fertile Crescent, which is a series of mountain ranges that surround Mesopotamia. And that is one of these centers of, agri of early agriculture. And what you see here is this particular village here, Tzatal Huyuk, uh, which uh, originated 9,500 years ago. So about the same time as agriculture. And I'm not trying to get into what came first, is it sedentarism or agriculture, that probably changes from area to area. But you see here some of these archaeological uh, digs. Um, archaeologists, like in other science, like to reconstruct things, to see how did it work, how difficult was it. <laughs> and um, to quote, so this is, uh, they have actually rebuilt it. Uh, here, I, I don't think that the door here is realistic because actually people got into their house through the roof. Uh, and I'll show you later. And so there was a ladder to get into. You see here they had an oven and they had other areas, uh, storage areas. They also had wall paintings, for example. Okay. And um, so this is a reconstruction of what part of the village looked like. It may have had up to 5,000 to 8,000 people. And there is a certain amount of urbanism, there is a certain amount of structure into the housing. Um, there are some public places, but otherwise no streets. Okay. Uh, this looks a view from the top as to one of these houses. You had here the oven, a hearth, and then storage places or places where people just could uh, sit down. Okay. One of the other technical advances was the development of ceramics, also about that time. And a third technological advance was the domestication. So what is domestication really? And what is a domestic, a crop? Oh, it looks, sounds like mine actually. <laughs> uh, uh, and what is a crop different from a wild plant? Okay. So domestication is really a selection process. And what do people select for? Well, they select for adaptation to a agricultural environment, a field condition, but also for increasing attractiveness or usefulness of the plant uh, for eating, for uh, clothing, fibers, and so on, let's say. And basically, the, 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 the starting materials are a series of mutants that appear in these wild populations that people either consciously or unconsciously select for until they become really part of the, uh, the population. And so important aspects are here is that you need to have cultivation. You cannot have domestication without cultivation. So it's, it's really a necessary condition. But it's not a sufficient condition. And the parallel that I can draw is with actually with animals. You can tame an animal, but you, that doesn't mean that the animal is domesticated. The animal will have learned some tricks if it's tamed, but unless its progeny has the same behavior, it will not have been domesticated. So you can cultivate a plant and it will um, be subject to selection during cultivation, but unless its progeny then shows differing traits for which it has been selected, you cannot talk about domestication. You really have to have these genetic changes taking place in the population. It is also an evolutionary process, and you see, depending on the crop, you see different degrees of domestication. And finally, the most important thing is that a crop, a fully domesticated crop, cannot survive in the wild on its own. And the best example of that is take corn. If you look at the ear of corn, normally a wild plant ought to be able to distribute its seeds. How does that happen in corn where the, the kernels remain on the cob? And in addition, they are surrounded by, by the husks of the, of the ear. So corn has lost its ability to propagate itself on its own and is therefore thought to be fully domesticated. Okay? So these changes, and this to tell you that these changes are very profound, very marked uh, through, the, through human selection. Give you a few examples of the traits. So domesticated plants have lost seed dispersal this is a ear of wild maize called teosinte. And what you see is that at maturity, the husks separate, and also the grains are becoming individualized and will be dumped on the soil. The same thing here for this wild relative of wheat. And 
for the crop that I'm working on in beans, what you see here are the pods of wild beans. They open up and they twist and in, they pr provide kind of a slingshot movement to the seeds so that they, they distribute it around the plant. These are two domesticated types, the one here for dry beans, so you'd say pinto bean, kidney beans, and so on. You can open them up, but only uh, it wouldn't happen in the field. And this is the pod of a green bean, or a snap bean, in which the pod does not open at all. It shrivels, and that remains it, let's say. So snap beans are an example of full domestication, at least for that trait. In the wild, plants have to compete with other plants for water, for air, for, uh, for water, for uh, light. So they have a very vigorous plant type with multiple branches and so on. In a field, this would mean competing with each other. So what farmers have done is to actually select for much more compact growth habits. And you see here an example, again, of maize or corn. This is wild maize with a lot of branches and a single stem in corn. The same thing for a wild bean here. This is grown in the greenhouse to actually show the extent of a plant. This is about six feet high. and uh, We could grow it much higher if we provided a longer pole. And this is a bush bean uh, with about a foot high. Okay. So a much more compact growth habit. And this is an example of uh, permillet in Africa, which is one of the most drought tolerant cereals one could find. And you see here the wild type, very branched versus the domesticated type. Okay. The other thing that people have selected for has nothing to do with actually growing the materials in the fields, but it's what they're going to do, how they're going to use it. And people are attracted by novelty. And this is something that Darwin already had observed, is that those organs that are harvested by humans, typically in the domesticated state, show a much higher level of variation. So let me, in, in corn, we harvest the seeds. You, you look at all the cobs here, different colors different shapes of seeds. In lettuce, we harvest the leaves. So look at all the different types of lettuces we see here, um, different colors, different shapes. In squash, we harvest the fruit. Look at the sizes, the shapes of the fruit, the colors. And again, in the crop here, this is one variety I collected in Bolivia with one farmer. We identified at least 50, about 50 types of seeds in that one material grown by one farmer. Okay? And it's, you look at the different colors, the shapes of the, the spots, and so on. Okay. So this is what actually people select for because it represents a novelty. Okay? Now the type of inheritance tells us something also. Uh, it's of interest to geneticists, but also to how did society evolve under, after domestication. And what we see is that the, the type of inheritance, actually, even though the morphologically the differences are quite marked between wild and domesticated types, these differences are under simple genetic control. Now, without entering into the technical details, is that this means that there are actually few genes involved, that those genes are expressed reliably without too much effect of the environment. So wherever you actually grow the materials, they will express the trait. And then all, many of these domestication genes can be linked on the same chromosome. Okay. So it makes it easier to actually reconstitute what is called the domestication syndrome. So this series of traits that distinguish wild and domesticated types. Now the consequence of that is that domestication potentially was a fairly fast process. It could have taken place in a few decades, a few hundred years. Archaeologists think that it might have taken at least a thousand years or two thousand years, and I probably would have to side with them on that for a number of reasons I won't go into, but it was not an extensive dragged out process. Okay. Um, one of the, the, the questions, the more technical question, is whether this particular genetic architecture is a condition for domestication, and that comes to the issue of potential for domestication. There are some 250,000 plant species, but only, but certainly less than 1,000 have been domesticated. Why is it that some were domesticated and some not? And this is one of the unresolved issues in this field, is you know, what happens about this potential for domestication. 
are some species more prone to domestication than others. And it has a practical uh, importance because people are thinking of re-domesticating, of domesticating other species. And depending on the answer, this may be a reasonable prospect or not. Now, domestication in itself is a very complex uh, problem in that it involves a number of factors. You have what I would call the original, the causal uh, factors, the environment, as well as humans. And then you could say plants or animals are the response variable. Okay? It's, it's human and environment who probably conspire to actually cause this switch to agriculture and it's the plants and the animals that actually had to respond. And so to give you just one example, and this is from animals, is not every animal is equally suitable to domestication. And it depends on their behavior. So I would ask you, well, why hasn't the tiger been domesticated? The short answer here, the one sentence answer, is that the tiger has an attitude problem. <laughs> Okay? So the tiger doesn't like humans in the first place, and maybe that's understandable. Okay? Absolutely. But the tiger also does not like other tigers. So you cannot herd tigers like you can do with cows and so on. So there are these important behavioral characteristics that, in the case of animals, are important in determining which is going to be domesticated or not. Let's say. And the same thing you can do for some of these other characteristics. Reproduction is also an important trait. Can you manipulate reproduction to maybe constitute a herd, for example? Okay? And the same thing in plants also. Uh, many of our major crops are actually species that are selfing. So they self-fertilize instead of cross-fertilizing. Is that, again, has that helped domestication? Maybe, probably. Um, but we still need to investigate that further. Okay. Now, what triggered the switch to agriculture? And the short answer here is, again, we don't know. We would like to know. But what I can tell you is that probably uh, that, first of all, in these different areas where agriculture was initiated, it's probably a different model every time. The second thing is that the, probably the first trigger is this imbalance between supply and demand for plant products. Is that we came to a point in human evolution where there wasn't enough food for the population. Now why wasn't there enough food for that population? Maybe population had grown too much and or maybe the climate had changed and it became less or more favorable. Okay. Um, What about the climate thing? First of all, let me point out to you that these different areas on all the continents, agriculture arose more or less at the same time in these different areas, which were not communicating. This was, these were independent inventions. So it points to at least one cause that goes across the globe, and that means probably the climate, a climate change. And 10,000 years is about the end of the last ice age. So you have a warming up of the climate, what you see here, these are graphs that show here the temperature, and you see around 10,000 years ago, you see a rapid increase in temperature. Also, it comes down, the measure here is one for dust. And if you have a frozen landscape, wherever you don't have water, you have a lot of dust also. So that goes down 10,000 years also. So that's one thing. So you have a warming up of the climate, which may have made things drier. So more difficult to grow things in certain areas, but not in others. The other point that's marked, remarked here by Richardson et al. at uh, Davis is that the climate became less variable. And what you see here are the, the unfiltered uh, kind of measures of temperature. You have filters here that tend to dampen year-to-year -year variation. And what you see is that after 10,000 years, the amount of variation becomes suddenly, for whatever reason, much smaller. Okay? So we have a warmer climate, but also a more stable climate. And so Richardson et al. argue that was humans were ready, and once the climate changed, they immediately started uh, practicing agriculture. So that's at least one reason. The other reason is, if this is a nomad, and this is a Yanomami 
Indian, how many children can you actually carry at any point in time? And it's clear that people have, have documented different ways in which population can be controlled. Uh, and they include abortion, infanticide, invalidicide, and so on and so on, delayed marriage, late weaning, and also in this case here, white, spy, white spacing uh, of children. Okay? But what if it does br this, these mechanisms break down? And you, in spite of that, you see an increase in population. And so I come back to the, the, the hypothesis is that we have this kind of imbalance between demand and supply. Demand being driven by population and supply being affected by the climate. Okay? So we see that's a kind of a general hypothesis. Now let me give you an example from currently what's happening right now. Forest trees are not thought to have been domesticated until recently. But now what you see is that forest trees are being domesticated, and I include in those trees, for example, poplar, uh, yellow pine, and so on. And it is because our demand for wood, for forest products, keeps increasing. And, in, and among these products, I include not only uh, paper and lumber and fuel, but also um, protection of wildlife. For example. So it said, means that we set aside forests where that are not going to be touched. It also means that, um, that we want to have forests for leisure, for example. So the demand for these forests increases. Uh, and so what people, the response of people then is to intensify forest production. And what they are doing now is to really domesticating uh, tree species such as poplar. Okay? So we have come now to the, the second stage, and here what we, we see is that so agriculture is being, has been initiated, and what agriculture does actually is to generate a positive feedback loop. Population increase may have been one of the causes of the switch to agriculture, but it is then also one of the, the outcomes of agriculture. And the fact of it is that agriculture produces more food, but it also requires more work. And especially children become an economic asset uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, they provide labor, they provide wealth, in dowries, for example, but also security for aged people. Okay. So what you enter then, once you start practicing agriculture, unless children become a, a, a source of labor, is that you're going to have more people, you need more food, they're going to produce more food, but it requires more work more children, and you get into this cycle. And so what you see is that there is an increase in population growth after the introduction of agriculture. Now what is the, uh, there are a number of consequences for that. First of all, a number of people don't need to practice agriculture anymore because agriculture produces a surplus of food. So that is the beginning then of a division of labor and hierarchical societies, where some people are going to tell other people what to do, um, and so on. And you see the beginning of uh, more complex uh, societies. And to compare this, and I'll come back to that later on, in our current system, we have two farmers for 100, individual, 100 individuals. So at the beginning, the majority of the people were involved in food procurement. Now it's only two per 100. The the, one of the responses to this increased population then is that people uh, started to migrate outward from the centers of origin. And it was basically, as you'll see later, it's either you join us or you get out of the way. Okay. So let me document then or illustrate some of the early events of the spread of agriculture. And there's a number of them. The best one is uh, the Fertile Crescent into Europe. Uh, but there is another, a number of other ones. Again, this is a map of the world with, in yellow, the centers, some of the centers of uh, origin of agriculture. And the arrows point to the major center, the major dispersals from these centers of origin. Okay. Um, one of them I'll be talking more about is the, exactly the Fertile Crescent here. I uh, will also be talking about Mesoamerica into the United States in the next slides. So the Fertile Crescent is the, the Southwest Asian center of origin 
And that one is believed to have given rise to four different migrations. One into Europe, another into Africa, and we'll see the example of Egyptian, ancient e e Egypt, one into Central Asia, and then the other one to India. What people, what linguists, some linguists at least believe, is that these migrations um, can also, um, also represent the, the, the appearance of major families of language, or human language. So into, uh, Europe, into Europe, we have the Indo-European languages. We have the Altaic languages into Central Asia, a mix of Indo-European and uh, Elamo-Dravidian into India, and as well as the Afro-Asiatic languages into Northern Africa. So we have human migrations, but you also have language migrations uh, appearing now. <laughs> driven by the spread of uh, agriculture. This is an example, this is Europe, and with the lines that you see there are gene frequency lines of modern humans, modern Europeans. And what you see is that there is a major gradient going from the southeast to the northwest. And it's thought that this gradient actually reflects the migration of people from the Fertile Crescent into Europe at the point where they were introducing agriculture into Europe. Okay? So it would have involved what is called a demic diffusion, so people-driven uh, diffusion, but intermating with local population, and that's how you generate these uh, gene frequencies. Okay? So uh, the remarkable thing, I think, is that even after 10,000 or 8,000 years, you still see these gene frequencies in contemporary humans in, uh, in Europe. Another migration was into, into Africa, and the Egyptians themselves did not domesticate any crops. They imported their domesticated crops from the Fertile Crescent. They may have domesticated both the cat and the donkey, but as far as we can tell, no, you, uh, no, no plants. Okay? Um, now, it, it is interesting to actually go through these mural paintings and actually try to identify some of the crops. And you see here, this is wheat. And it's tetraploid wheat, so it's a kind of intermediate version of wheat. It's not the bread wheat that we know. Um, you see here, this is flax. This is the fiber crop of the Egyptians, of the ancient Egyptians. Okay. Uh, this is olive, also domesticated in the Fertile Crescent. And then you have a series of palm trees. Probably among them is the date palm, okay. also introduced from the Fertile Crescent. And clearly, flax was the fiber of Egypt. Um, it served both daily, daily needs as well as uh, the, the needs of the, the pharaoh. Uh, what you see here is the mummies were actually wrapped into uh, tissues of, made of flax. Now, one of the, the interesting thing about this uh, field of crop evolution is that you get your evidence where, in all sorts of places, including in our own bodies. I've talked about the genes already, but what about the composition of our bodies? Our composition, the composition of our bodies reflects what we eat. And in this case, this is an example of where people have looked at the carbon composition of our bones. and. What you see here, this is an isotope of carbon, it's carbon-13. And what you see is that in North America, around a thousand years ago, there is this sudden switch modification in the composition, and you see suddenly a much higher level of carbon-13. And what is that due to? It's the introduction of maize, or corn, from Mesoamerica into the eastern part of North America. And it is related that corn has a different type of photosynthesis than the plants that people were eating before. It is a so-called C4 photosynthesis, which accepts more of this carbon-13 isotope, and therefore our body, bodies become richer if we eat a lot of corn. Okay? And so the introduction of, of corn in eastern North America has been dated to uh, only 1,000 years ago. Okay, which is a very recent phenomenon, even though corn had been domesticated maybe at least four or 5,000 years ago in Mexico, 
So, so much I've illustrated some of these early migrations of, of agriculture, which took place fairly quickly after the origin of agriculture, but it has go been going on for quite some time, and I think that the first talk in this series was about the Silk Road. Okay? So I thought I would maybe introduce an example to kind of link the two. And so you see here the Silk Road, which as you might know is not one road. It's not like Road 66 with a sign. And, uh, you know, it's uh, multiple roads here. Uh, but it basically went between China and the Near East. And it was uh, very important. It means that people traveled, ideas traveled, uh, represent the introduction of Buddhism in China, for example. But also crops were exchanged along this road. And we see here a number of crops that were domesticated in China, peach, citrus, and mulberry, to feed the silkworms, were introduced into the Near East and from there into Europe and Northern Africa. And on the other hand, you have pomegranate here, which was domesticated in the Fertile Crescent and was introduced into China and became an important symbol, cultural symbol uh, in China. Okay, so the situation then is after several, even several thousands of years, is that you have this thorough mixing introduction of crops in both the old world and the new world. Okay. This is the state of our knowledge, geographic knowledge in the old world by Europeans in 1490. And uh, what you see here is what people knew, the new part of Africa, but also India and so on. And in the 15th century, there were a number of changes. Uh, in Western Europe, you had the appearance of the first nation states. And those nation states tried to establish their economic power, in part by promoting uh, commerce and trade with other areas of the world. One of the things that they were interested in is spices from Eastern Asia. But there were a number of roadblocks to that. First of all, the Mongolian Empire in the 13th and the 14th century had disappeared. And with that also what has been called the Mongolian Peace of Pax Mongolica had also disappeared. So it made travel along the Silk Road more difficult. It was also the Turkish Empire became established. They had conquered uh, Constantinople or Istanbul 1453. So that was another roadblock. And then in addition to that, Venice had a monopoly on trade in the Eastern Mediterranean. So these nation states say, well, what's the solution to that problem? So we get to the, the third stage, which are a series of explorations um, in order to kind of circumnavigate the, the world. And this is a famous map. It may be a little um, difficult to see, but this was a map of the Portuguese in 1502 it was a state secret. And it was smuggled out of Lisbon by an Italian, Cantona. And what it shows actually is very interesting. The solution that the Portuguese proposed was to actually circumnavigate Africa to get to Eastern Asia. And you see on the map here, all these flags here are the, the points where the Portuguese had established a point of presence. And so you see here, they had also uh, by accident uh, identified or discovered Brazil. And it was because there was a number of storms here and made them jump on the wrong direction. But that was not the original intent. Okay? Their intent was really to go around Africa and into India. Okay. Now the solution of Christopher Columbus was different. They say, well, I'm going to go. Um, I assume that the Earth is round, that it's not flat, and I'm going to go in the other direction. And this is, you could say, the state of the art of maps in 1492. And it's the oldest surviving globe that people know of. It's in the museum in Nuremberg in Germany. Uh, the people in Nuremberg nicknamed it the Earth Apple. And what it shows is very interesting because this is Europe, this is Africa, you have, again, these flags here with the points of presence of the Portuguese, the Spanish. This is China, and this is what's thought to be um, Japan or Sipango. And so Christopher Columbus' solution was to say, well, I'm going to go this way. And we know the, his the rest of the history. But I thought it was interesting to, to be able to show you this because this globe would soon be outdated. Okay? 
it happens, happens to all of us, I think. So what this triggered, actually, was this intense exchange, not within the old world or within the new world, but between the two. And I'll give you two examples. So food crops were exchanged, and they become quickly a traditional part of, of people's lives, of culture, and so on. So this is a slide I took in, uh, in Bolivia, doing one of uh, my explorations. And on the face of it, you say, well, this is traditional agriculture. You know? Sure, quinoa is a plant that was domesticated in the Andes. But wheat is a plant that was actually domesticated in the Fertile Crescent. And yet, it is really part of their lives and part of their food, and they make bread and so on. On the other hand, this photo here is in the old world, and the, it's considered to be a typical Tuscan dish. Well, if you look at the ingredients, beans, tomato, and peppers, they were all domesticated in the New World. So it would be very difficult to imagine Italian cuisine without tomatoes, for example. Okay, yet tomatoes are thought to have been domesticated in Mexico. So fairly quickly, after 1492, these crops were exchanged and became part of the local culture, including the uh, cuisine. I'll skip this. Uh, it's already late in the day, I think. Another graph, I think. Another thing that people did was pursue these spices and other opportunities, for example. And what you see here is an old map. It show, shows the Molucca or Spice Islands. And these Western European powers were really after those spices. And you had three countries, Portugal, the Netherlands, and England, going after the ownership of these islands because they contained principally clove, nutmeg, and mace, which is a form of nutmeg. Okay? And so for several centuries, they have been struggling to actually hold on to these islands. And it's, again, part of that movement to kind of start looking for other economic opportunities and exchange these crops. Another thing that they looked at here, and is illustrated here, this is nutmeg. Uh, this is what you see here is Indonesia, New Guinea, and the, the Molucca are here, these islands between the Celebes and the New, uh, New Guinea. And the nutmeg was of interest, but also sandalwood as a product that gives, um, it's, it's used to make, make perfume, for example. Okay? So it's not all about foods, there are other opportunities also. And finally, there were also scientific endeavors, notably the explorations of von Humboldt and Beauplan. And they were interested, they went to South America, they had extensive trips there, they collected plant samples, more than 60,000 herbarium samples, for example. Uh, they studied the uh, working of uh, volcanoes, how vegetation was distributed by altitude and by exposure, and this is illustrated here. And also they described specific plants, ornamentals here on the left, but also some other uses, non, you would say non-food uses or non-traditional uses, like this particular plant, which is an ingredient in curare. And what it does, it has a compound that causes um, paralysis and therefore the death of the, uh, the organism. Okay? And so we have come now to the last stage of my presentation. And what is the current situation? We have a situation in which you know, there is a thorough kind of access and mix of all these different plants from all over the world. It's where it was domesticated has almost has become somewhat irrelevant, except if you're interested in genetic diversity. And what is happening now in the 20th and the 21st century? So let's go back to the, the supermarket again. And we are in a different aisle here. And uh, the aisle with the apples. And again, you might say, well, there's a fair amount of diversity there, but I could go to a supermarket in Davis and I'll see the same apples. It's, you know, it's red and golden delicious. It's, uh, what is it, Macintosh, it's Brayburn, uh, it's Gala, and so on. It's the same thing, let's say. So um, let's ask our questions again. Where was it domesticated and where is it produced? The area of origin here is in Central Asia, and it's specifically in Kazakhstan. 
around the mountains here, you see here that formed kind of the, the border with the other Central Asian countries, and you see them outlined here. And this is a fairly recent finding by USDA research geneticists. Um, and you see some of the vegetation, some of these trees in the wild, and some of the, the, these so-called wild apples uh, that have been found. Okay? The other question is, where is it produced? Well, the state of production in the United States is Washington State. That's kind of the apple state. Uh, you have sure Pennsylvania produces some. California produces some, but really the state. And so most likely, if you go to a supermarket, the apples are going to come all the way from Washington State. Okay. Or they might even come from further away, either from Canada in yellow, or in um, orange from Chile, or in purple from New Zealand. And that is, you go to the southern hemisphere, you reverse the seasons, so you get a, a kind of a year-long supply of apples. That sounds good. But well, well, the downside of it is the distance that these products have to travel. And people have introduced the concept of a food odometer. How many kilometers or miles does a food ingredient have to travel before it reaches your plate? And the idea is that, well, maybe we ought to have food that comes from a closer place than maybe across the globe, from New Zealand, for example. And so you see here, what this graph actually shows is how much further what they call conventionally produced food has to travel compared to a local production. So if you have a high, this means that broccoli usually, if you buy it in the store, it comes from very far away. On the other hand, if you buy pumpkins, it's probably local production. And it kind of makes sense at this time of the year. Now the apples we are looking at is kind of intermediate. And I will talk later about another crop, and that is spinach. And you see here is that it's about uh, 50 times more travel if you buy it than if you buy it from a source in the supermarket than from a local, local source. Okay? So transportation has become extremely important in agriculture, in the distribution of agricultural products. Uh, I'll skip this. This is a, an example of, you know, you have many growers and many consumers, and what happens in between? There is all this system there that arranges that, but it's also, in a sense, a limitation to this diversity. I discussed the limit to diversity earlier on for the apples, and it is because all of these apples have to go through this system here that kind of limits genetic diversity and the type of apples you're going to see in the store. Now, if transportation is such an important thing, you might say, well, with the increases in, in energy prices, is that going to affect it? And I would suggest that maybe it's not going to affect it. Because if you buy a dollar of produce, you only spend four cents in transportation. That, uh, even to, uh, to me, that's somewhat incomprehensible. I thought it would have been higher. And even if the energy prices are going to go up two or three times, it's still going to be maybe only 10%. But in part, what is happening is that we are not taking into account the environmental costs of energy use, for example. Nor are we taking into account the environmental costs of packaging. Because if you start transporting produce over a large distance, it's going to have to be well packaged. You're going to have to use cardboard, plastic, and so on and so on, for example. So what is the price structure going to become once we start paying attention to these environmental issues? That remains to be answered. So the trends in food consumption overall in this last stage that I've been discussing is that you know, food trade has increased 184% uh, over the years uh, versus only food production by 84%. Okay? So more food is produced, but it's also transported over much larger distances. Uh, Americans produce, eat a lot of food that is produced outside of the country, which may or may not be a uh, concern, except that, it, again, it involves more transportation. And some benefits of local um, production are better, reduction in energy consumption, uh, an increased diversity of the landscape. Instead of having these monocultures, uh, we could have a more diverse landscape. Uh, increased control over local food production, which now 
it is pretty much in the hand of that kind of intermediate series of structures I showed you for the Apple marketing. Uh, and showing that added value goes to the farmers, in that graph I showed you earlier, the farmer only gets 20 cents, which is very little. And then also improved access to fresh and less uh, processed food. Now, I'm not advocating doing away with this whole transportation system. We need a diverse diet, and this diet will come because there is a transportation system that brings in foods of different origins and, and different types of food. But I think that what we have not done is to look at the environmental consequences of this system. Okay. Another downside of this transportation system, and you are probably aware of these kind of the, what has been called the spinach scare, mm -hmm. is it has all been traced back to three counties in California. Monterey County, San Benito County, and Santa Clara County. And the spinach that was contaminated all came from this very small area. And yet the people affected were distributed all over the United States. That is a consequence of having such, on one hand, centralized production, and on the other hand, such an extensive transportation system. If you have a problem somewhere, it's going to blow up geographically also. So that is something, again, that we have to consider and that is not considered in, these, in the, the current organization of agricultural production. So in conclusion, then, what I've, uh, I wanted to show in this talk is how Agriculture has started from what could be a very localized phenomenon in several areas of the world to really uh, a global enterprise. And that in between those two, there have been a number of you know, travel, explorations, migrations, every type of human movement that you can actually imagine. Okay? Um, at the same time, what this has caused is this split between food producers and food consumers. And most of the food that we eat, we don't really know exactly how it has been produced. And regardless of what you think, I think that it would be worthwhile knowing more. And you can then make an informed decision. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.